the, the torture of Iraq has been a 30 year process now, but unfortunately I think with China, it'll be even longer, even longer than 30 years. And I think that it's going to be the defining conflict of this century. Now it doesn't have to be, but the reality is that China as a massive economic power, primarily economic, not so much political because China has a very hands-off foreign policy. For many decades, China has had a lot of bilateral relations with countries and has not meddled in their internal affairs, including countries that, you know, honestly, you would not expect to have good relations with China. So China diplomatically and politically has, has shown itself to be a, a very hands-off partner, unlike the United States. But economically, the United States sees China as a massive threat in scare quotes because it's the largest economic f engine in the entire world now. And, you know, there, there's estimates about whether, when, when or whether or not China will overtake the U.S. economy. I, I, don't, I think those questions miss the forest for the trees. China is the dominant economic power. And we even see, for instance, the European Union. Just there, were, there was a new study that shows that, that the majority or rather, rather the plurality of the trade it does is with China, not with the United States. So the U.S. as the country that has dominated the world since the end of the first Cold War and the overthrow of the socialist bloc, you know, George H.W. Bush declared this era that we're new in the, the, the new world order. And, and you know, that, that's been kind of distorted and it's not some grand conspiracy involving like lizard people. No, I mean, the, the new world order is that it's a unipolar world in which the U.S. is the global hegemonic power. And essentially, the entire planet is ruled by the U.S. It's Pax Americana. And we have seen that the, the rise of China is a so-called threat, not, not, not a threat in a way that it actually poses a threat to Americans, but rather the U.S. sees it as a threat because it's a country that can challenge Washington's unipolar domination of the world. I think, I think that's the moment that we're, we're living in right now. And that's why I think it's so important that you have this initiative, because the reality is that there doesn't need to be conflict. There, there can be diplomacy. There can be positive relations between these countries. And believe it or not, the U.S. doesn't need to be the world's policeman and emperor and merchant. I mean, there can be multiple powers in a multipolar world. And I think that's what we should advocate for as peace activists. But unfortunately, that view is is not popular, not only in the Republican Party, but also in the Democratic Party. How imperialism and racism fuel each other. There's, there's a loop, a feedback loop, a kind of dialectical relationship. And frequently when liberals, when Democrats in the United States talk about anti-racism, they remove what, what in my view, is the, is the most important part of anti-racism, opposition to war and empire. I mean, what, what is more racist than bombing black and brown people and bombing Muslims and imposing medieval sanctions on them, as we see with Iran. So millions of, Iran, millions of civilians in Iran and Venezuela and all these countries that just so happen to be racialized countries in the global south are suffering, can't get food, can't get medicine. I mean, to me, that is the most extreme form of racism. But frequently, you know, there's this kind of co-optation the Democratic Party and kind of neoliberal forces have done. So Racism becomes all about microaggressions, but, but what about the macroaggressions, the, the wars and empires? So, I mean, the, the point you just mentioned is, is so important that we now see this massive demonization campaign against China. And so frequently, U.S. politicians say, whoa, whoa we're, we're not against the Chinese people. We're just against the Chinese Communist Party, the, the government of China. But the reality is that oftentimes that, that so-called distinction is not actually what, what manifests itself in political culture. And that's why we see people who of Chinese descent being attacked at record levels in the United States, in Canada, in Western Europe, hate crimes arising. It's not a coincidence that the same thing happened at the beginning of the so-called war on terror. And the, the US government said, well, we're not against Muslims, we're just against terrorism. But we saw a massive increase in racialized violence against brown people who people assumed were Muslim. I mean, some of them weren't even Muslim. They were like Indians, like Hindu Indians people thought were Muslim. So, I mean, this is a pattern here, right? At every time the U.S. pivots toward a new conflict, it needs to justify that imperial aggression and it uses racism as a tool.
So now, just as we saw during the war on terror, we see dehumanization of Chinese people. The, the narrative around COVID is it's the China virus, as Trump and his administration said. And we're supposed to believe that it came from Chinese people eating bats or something. There's this racist narrative that Chinese people are, are backward and they're barbarians in some way. It's absolutely preposterous, considering actually much of civilization's most important advances come from Asia and specifically China. The compass, so many forms of mathematics and so many other invent inventions. So th these things are all related, but frequently, like I said, the Democratic Party kind of liberal establishment will intentionally leave out some of these key issues. That's why I think it's so important for us to talk about it and for us to center opposition to war and empire at the heart of the progressive movement. Because in my view, if the progressive movement doesn't revolve around anti-war and anti-imperialist politics, it's not progressive. There's a few ways to approach this. First of all, there are the media narratives and the myths and the, frank the frankly, the lies that are being spewed. And I think that, you know, we can talk about people kind of rationally in a way. And, you know, unless they're too far gone and they think that like Biden is a Chinese sleeper cell. And and I mean, it's incredible to see how after years, Democrats, you know, the Democratic Party establishment weaponized this Russiagate conspiracy, claiming that Trump was a Putin puppet and everything bad in the U.S. is the fault of the Kremlin. And now we've seen some people on, on the Republican side of the aisle doing basically the same, but just replacing, just taking every article, but replacing Putin's name for Xi Jinping and replacing the Kremlin for the Chinese Communist Party. And it's basically the same thing. So, you know, that kind of thing, a lot of those people are, are kind of, they, they just, they drunk the Kool-Aid and, and we should, you know, try to debate them and argue with them. But, you know, that, that, that's just a religion at this point. And the US religion is always scapegoating some foreign boogeyman. But I think a lot of people, they otherwise they might you know have good intentions but they think because they've consumed so much media propaganda that china is some evil boogeyman it's this totalitarian regime and the reality is look you have to just look at basic facts like one and this, this isn't to say the chinese government's perfect at all of, of course but the reality is that polls consistently show that the vast majority of people in china are supportive of their government we're talking about over three quarters up 80 percentile range of, of people in China have positive views of the government, which is pretty incredible considering in the US, usually it's around 40 percent or even lower, depending on what government institution you're talking about. So we have to we can first of all say, look, I mean, certainly the gov Chinese government has issues, but the reality is that the vast majority of Chinese people have a very positive view of the government. So don't you think that maybe we should rethink some of some of the myths that we're told that the Chinese people are oppressed by their government? And then second of all, I mean, you can look at some of the absolutely preposterous things like uh, it's so funny every time there is some kind of technological element of surveillance or social media when U.S. corporations do it. it it's portrayed as some normal innocuous thing. But if a Chinese company does it, oh, it's it's totalitarianism. So there's also the perspective of people say, well, the Chinese government is always spying on the people. And, and we have to say, well, first of all, I'm against mass surveillance, of course, but uh, you realize that you're living in the most mass surveilled country on earth, right? I mean, did you, did you forget the NSA scandal? Did you forget Edward Snowden? Did, did all of that just, just go away? So, I mean, th there's all these double standards. So China is just portrayed as some uniquely evil country when the reality is that some of these problems that people in China, you know, they, they often have criticism, but some of those problems they're dealing with are, are the same in the United States or even worse. I mean, if we're talking about police brutality, I mean, those are problems that are unique to the United States, the extreme racism in the United States. Those are, those are we do not see this, the near the same level of police brutality in China. So there's a matter of situating it in that context. And then finally, there's just like the preposterous lies that we're told frequently. So the latest is that, China's committing genocide, which is part of this new campaign to basically portray Beijing as the new Nazi Germany. So if you don't support U.S. aggression against it, whether that's military aggression or economic aggression through sanctions and a trade war, then you're you're helping fascism and you would have supported Hitler. I mean, it's first of all, it's preposterous because one, 
the people who started this narrative were the Trump administration led by a racist who wouldn't condemn white supremacists and who said it after a Nazi rally, they were good people on both sides. So to the Trump administration is the one that started this myth that China is committing genocide. And you, then you, we can talk about other things like Adrian Zenz, who's this far right extremist, who's the one pushing this narrative, who works for the Victims of Communism Foundation, which is so extreme and right wing that it considers every death caused by COVID to be a death of communism. So, so the reality is that we're talking about far right groups. We're talking about Trumpist extremists. And a lot of liberals have internalized their narrative. So I think we should ask those liberals, wait a second, you say that Trump is wrong about everything. And, and I agree with you, Trump is wrong about all these things. So why do you think Trump would be right about China? And, and the reality is that the Democratic Party, of course, is always bipartisan and on board with these issues. But I think if you actually, if you try to interrogate these issues with people, especially progressive minded people, I think they, you can move them a bit. And, and uh, we don't, we're not, I'm not expecting people to overnight change their mind, but the reality is that I think a lot of people don't realize how they're, they're feeding into what is essentially new Cold War propaganda. And now the latest news, by the way, is that after Antony Blinken, this very hawkish neo neoconservative figure who's leading the State Department, even his own lawyers are now reconsidering the whole genocide thing because they realize there's not actual evidence of genocide. So you know, it, I think we're pushing back slowly, but my concern, like you said, is that more people who are left wing oriented are going to unite with the right wing. And I think that's something we have to push back against. I think a lot of it revolves around this narrative of fascism. And, you know, there is a very real threat of fasc of neo fascism. And that threat emanates almost entirely from the West. I mean, India has a fascistic regime and Turkey, you could say, is kind of fascistic, which is a NATO member. But really, the main kind of fountains of neo-fascist extremism today are coming from the United States and Western Europe. Well, in other parts of Europe, Central and Eastern Europe. It, and I mean, Poland, which is a NATO member, an EU member, Poland just was exposed for having a state historian. He had to resign. This is a historian who's employed by the Polish government because he was doing Nazi salutes. So like we're in the coup in Ukraine in which neo-Nazi forces and other fascists were at the forefront of overthrowing the Ukrainian government in 2014 because it was insufficiently anti-Russian as part of an EU neoliberal free trade agreement. I mean, and then this isn't even to mention the white supremacist terrorism in the United States the rise of the neo-fascist Vox Party in Spain, the far-right National Front in France. I mean, we're seeing a massive rise in far-right movements. But what's interesting is that Western liberal imperialists have realized that they could weaponize that and, and put the blame on China and also Russia. So that, that partially explains why there's been this narrative that Vladimir Putin is a crypto-fascist, and he's supporting fascists. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. I'm not a fan of Vladimir Putin's politics. You know, he's he's kind of center right conservative, but he's not a fascist. I mean, in the context of Russian politics, he's pretty centrist, honestly. Actually, Alexei Navalny is mo much more fascistic than Vladimir Putin, and, and he's the darling of NATO. And that's another example of this. I mean, Alexei Navalny, who who now is on the the front page of every newspaper, Navalny released an ad several years ago in which he compared Muslim immigrants in Russia to cockroaches who'd be, who should be stepped on or shot. So this is, this is the guy that NATO wants to replace Putin, who we're supposed to believe is supposedly a fascist. So it's, th that was, I think, the beginning of the part of this narrative. And now China, basically what they're saying is China's Nazi Germany. And if, if you don't oppose China, then you're not an anti-fascist. And in order to be anti-fascist, you have to oppose China. I mean, that, that's part of the ideological sleight of hand that's going on, which is incredible because if you look at China's foreign policy abroad, I mean, China consistently supports progressive forces throughout Latin America and other parts of the world, whereas it's the US that's the one that's propping up far-right fascistic regimes in Bolivia, right now in Colombia, where Ivan Duque is trying to extend his term, in Honduras. I mean... Uh, not even to mention, you know, the, the Gulf regimes. And so it, it, the, the hypocrisy is incredible, but 
that's why I think we have to push back so hard against this idea that China is like fascistic in some way. And, and the main narrative, it's incredible. Like you said, the people pushing this idea that China is committing genocide against the Uyghur Muslim population are themselves neoconservatives who have supported every war on Muslim majority countries. People who supported the Iraq war, the Yemen war, the Syria war, the Libya war. This is the 10th year anniversary of the Libya war. Libya still doesn't have a central government. That country was destroyed. It was the most prosperous country in Africa. It was destroyed. There were open air slave markets for, for sub-Saharan African refugees, for dark-skinned Libyans. Meanwhile, the people who supported, who oversaw, who led that war are telling you, you have to support more conflict against China because China is violating the rights of Muslims. This isn't to dispute that China has a very heavy handed draconian policy against Uyghur extremism. But at the same time, we can't just close our eyes and pretend like the U.S. isn't meddling. I mean, it was incredible. The National Endowment for Democracy, the NED, which is an arm of the U.S. government, it's basically a CIA cutout. It was founded by the Ronald Reagan administration in the 1980s to do, as one of its co-founders said, to do what the CIA was doing covertly, but in the open. And the NED bragged several months ago that they have spent nearly 20 years funding with millions and millions of dollars Uyghur separatist groups. And we know this, the World Uyghur Congress. We know there's a variety of so-called human rights groups that are not human rights groups. I mean, that's the term they use. It's the weaponization of human rights. And these are groups that are often extremely right wing, by the way. And speaking of fascistic, they're often collaborating with not just the United States, but also Turkey and the Erdogan regime, which is extremely fascistic, which is ethnically cleansing the Kurdish population in the South, which is militarily occupying Northern Syria. So we're supposed to believe that Erdogan and U US neoconservatives like John Bolton and Mike Pompeo, who hate Muslims, who are Islamophobes, they're the ones supporting Muslim rights against evil China. I mean, it, it's incredible, but the reality is unfortunately a lot of people don't think about geopolitics because when, you when, when they see the term concentration camp thrown around, their brain turns off and they're like, oh, China's Nazi, China, Nazi, China, Nazi. I mean, because that's the whole, it's the distortion of what's going on in China and Xinjiang. It's, it's a complete, there, I mean, there are a lot of lies. It's a complete turning on the head to portray China, which is, again, supporting progressive forces in the world as Nazi-like and not the United States, which frankly, not to, not to be too hyperbolic, but just being realistic here, if we had to look at what happened in the 1930s with the rise of Nazism and fascism, and previously one of the most powerful countries in the world, Germany, becoming this hor horrible fascist dictatorship that committed genocide, hmm, if we had to pick one country in the world that is most similar, I'm not saying it's the same, but most similar to that scenario, it's going to be the United States, not China. But of course, that's why we're seeing such an insane new Cold War propaganda drive is to distract from the extreme, the extreme surge to the far right in U.S. politics and the rise of extremist groups and militias and white supremacist terrorists and violence and mass shootings and endless war. I mean... That's the most Nazi-like. The Soviet Union lost over 26 million people, 26 million. Meanwhile, in the US and Britain, we're talking about 400,000. And that's not, to, that's not to downplay how horrible that is, but we're talking about 400,000 in the US and Britain compared to 26 million in the Soviet Union. And that's not that, oh, we should also mention the between 12 and 20 million Chinese killed. I mean, we're talking about the vast majority of deaths in World War II came from the Soviet Union and China. And the Soviet Union was responsible for killing more than four fifths or for killing, wounding or capturing four fifths of Nazi soldiers in World War II. Basically, all of the fighting in World War II happened on the Eastern Front until around 1943. And then when we're talking about breaking the back of the Japanese fascist army, it was the Chinese. And again, 12 to 20 million Chinese killed and, and another kind of Japanese Holocaust committed against Chinese people. So the, the sacrifices these countries have made fighting fascism is incredible. And yeah, that's not to say, of course, Russia has a very different government today. 
Russia has a capitalist government that is much more conservative than the Soviet Union, but there still is a lot of national pride and anti-fascist sentiment today. And every year, one of the biggest celebrations in Russia is the great patriotic war against fascism. Whereas Trump, it, most recently, he, he just gave an incredible speech, I believe this was last year, in honoring the anniversary of World War II, and he didn't even mention the Soviet Union. He said, we thank the United States and Britain and France for defeating Nazism, just writing out the role the, of the country that did the vast majority of the fighting against fascism. So, I mean, that's a whole new level, but, but this isn't actually, this is not an irrelevant point. This is not just a historical debate because this is actually feeding into the rise of neo-fascism today. And there's a really good scholar named Jonathan Katz who lives in Lithuania and he's an expert on the history of Jews in Lithuania. And he has a, a very good website called Defending History in an academic journal. And it's called Defending History because it's about the attempt to rewrite the history of the Holocaust in World War II and how these far right groups in Eastern Europe, almost all of which are anti-Russian and pro-NATO, backed by NATO, backed by the United States, have been trying to rewrite the history of World War II to portray the Soviet Union as the villain and Nazi Germany as, if not the good guys, like the, the bystanders. And this is part of, I mentioned that in Poland, a state historian was just forced to resign because he, there was photos of him Nazi saluting. And we see all across Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, in the Baltic states, that there's this rise of these neo-fascist movements, which are all uniformly pro-West, pro-US, pro-NATO, anti-China, and anti-Russia. So th this is directly related to the fight against fascism. And again, this isn't to say that like China and Russia today are like some great perfect countries. No, I mean, they, they all have their own problems. Every country in the world has problems. There's no perfect country. But the reality is that we have to recognize, especially us as U.S. citizens, that it's Washington that is the one driving this aggressive policy. It's Washington that is supporting these extremist groups as proxies to try to weaken China and Russia. It's Washington that is constantly engaged in this great game, trying to surround Russia with NATO members and U.S. military bases and now surround, surround China, not only with bases and allies of the United States, but also with troops. We saw in the Obama administration, or now as it's referred to as the Obama-Biden administration, we saw the pivot to Asia was kind of the hallmark of the foreign policy of the Hillary Clinton State Department. And when they say pivot to Asia, they mean pivot to war with China is what they really mean. They mean sending two thirds of US military personnel over on the border of China into the South China Sea to surround China. Why are they doing that? Why do we want a war with China? This is the largest country in the world. We saw the horror of World War II. Do we really want a World War III? It's insane. H how do you report on real human rights abuses without feeling anti-China sentiment? Well, first of all, there's a few different questions here, or a few different responses, I would say. One, you have to answer the question depending on what your perspective is. I mean, I'm a journalist, and... A lot of people aren't journalists, they're activists and organizers, so it's different for each of us. I mean, look, we can acknowledge, again, that these countries have real problems in human rights abuses. Again, every country in the world does. And it's pretty incredible hearing U.S. politicians complain about people being put in re-education facilities that they call concentration camps, considering, which is insane, it's a ridiculous smear, they're not concentration camps. I mean, you can criticize them, and I'll get to that in a second, but they're not concentration camps. Meanwhile, the United States has children, immigrants, undocumented people in what you could call internment camps. I mean, if they're, if they're concentration camps in China, then the US definitely has concentration camps. I mean, we're talking about extreme abuse of immigrants in the United States and their privatized and for-profit facilities. But we never hear people say that the United States is, is running massive concentration camps for Latinos, which is basically what they are. So there's the insane hypocrisy there. But then we can also acknowledge, yes, and like I said, we can acknowledge and we should acknowledge that, okay, China has a very heavy-handed policy. I would not support it. And the, you know, the re-education facilities, you know, it's, it, it's, 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 it's pretty awful, right? 
But at the same time, those are not concentration camps. Like that's a very different thing. And what we're talking about is that, I mean, this information is public that and the Chinese government talks about it. And this isn't to defend it, but just the, the reality is that these are facilities where there are often Muslim leaders. There are people are allowed to worship. There are imams. Those are like kind of the Muslim equivalent of priests who give lectures and talk to people. I mean, these are facilities where people who have extremist views are, are put in. And the reality is that the U.S., re its response to extremism is just to kill people with drones. It's just to murder people, or in the case of the United States, to put, throw people up in, in Gitmo. I mean, Guantanamo is still open, by the way. It hasn't been closed, even though Obama claimed it would be. And again, so this isn't to defend that policy, but we're talking about different degrees of extremism here, like the, the, in terms of the response. And, and also just, again, these are, it's not, these are not concentration camps because the whole point of the use of concentration camp is that it's supposed to turn your brain off and make you think China equals Nazi. And then there's also the whole element of the numbers. I mean, the numbers aren't totally insane. I mean, one week there's 8 million and there's 13 million. There's more than the even entire Uyghur population and others. Don't. No, I mean, these numbers are absolutely absurd. They're totally fictitious. We know that because as we've documented at the gray zone, my colleagues, uh, Max Blumenthal, uh, Ajit Singh, they've documented how these numbers come from two different studies. One of them is a group called Chinese Human Rights Defenders, which is a right wing lobby group funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, a CIA cutout and led by people who have called for overthrowing the Chinese government. That's their goal. They've weaponized this notion of human rights to try to overthrow their government. Most of them live in Washington in exile or New York. And they did a study in which they interviewed eight Uyghurs in Xinjiang, eight, and asked them about their families and their friends. And then they used those testimonies of eight Uyghurs and multiplied it by the number of towns and the, the, the population of Xinjiang to get 1 million. I mean, it's totally absurd. If you submitted this report to a, a, an undergrad statistics class, you would get an F. You would fail your statistics class. I mean, this is totally fake numbers here. And then the other study comes from Adrian Zenz. And, th that's th th and this particular number also comes from this extremist group based in Turkey. I should mention that a lot of these Uyghur separatist groups are living in Turkey, supported by the Erdogan regime, which is, again, pretty fascistic. And they, there's this interview that was released by Radio Free Asia that was translated that came from a Uyghur extremist channel that has had on people who support this extremist Al-Qaeda aligned group called the Turkestan Islamic Party, TIP, which is active in Syria. They have child soldiers and they proudly post the photos of them fighting. They work with Al-Qaeda. They have links even to ISIS. So we're talking about extremist fascist groups that released this, these claims that were then translated by Radio Free Asia, which is created by the CIA as a propaganda arm. And then that number is just circulated. So we have to also number, say that, OK, you can criticize China policy, but you have to always situate it within the context of what's actually happening as opposed to the insane myths and narratives and distortions in the media. So, I mean, that's why it's such a tricky thing to do, because the, if you actually saw what actual China policy is, you would see that it's, again, this isn't to defend it and say it's perfect, but it's not, it's much more innocuous than we're than the, the extreme Nazi-esque comparisons that, that we're supposed to believe in. And I know that this is kind of complicated. And, and the reason is that I don't want to get really, because in order to have a, a, de a deep in-depth conversation about this, you have to look at the numbers, at the statistics, at the sources, at the facts. And that's actually very complicated, which is why it's so easy to just spew this propaganda and say China concentration camps, millions, because very few people actually look at the granular details and see there is no there there. And in order to look at that, it takes a long time to explain. It's complicated. It's confusing. It takes long articles. But anyone who's interested in looking in this issue more deeply, you can go to thegrayzone.com. That's gray with an A. And we have a lot of reporting on this, just showing how ridiculous it is. But at the end of the day, the point is that the, the, the most simple answer and the most true answer, just, just qualitatively, is that this is new Cold War propaganda.
No one is saying that China is perfect and has a perfect human rights record, but it is propaganda. It is disinformation. It is information warfare that is aimed at turning people's brains off and manufacturing consent for Washington's aggression in the new Cold War. Unfortunately, that's what we're in right now. That's not even just my view. If you listen to neoconservative, prominent right-wing figures like the, one of the most prominent right-wing historians at Harvard University who published a New York Times op-ed, uh, Douglas Murray, saying that we're in a new Cold War with China and it, we should embrace that term. Or listen to the right-wing billionaire oligarch in Hong Kong who the Trump administration worked with, Jimmy Lai, who said we're in a new Cold War. Or listen to Mike Pompeo himself. himself. Mike Pompeo gave a historic speech at the Richard Nixon Library saying that Richard Nixon was a good president, but he made the mistake of having the meeting with China in 1972. He never should have done that. The opening was a bad idea. China's the enemy. We need to overthrow the Chinese government. The US government said that. The US State Department said that under Pompeo. We are in a new Cold War. You, you can't ignore it. Now, I think our responsibility should be to expose the lies and propaganda of the Cold War and to end the Cold War and return to a peaceful diplomatic relationship with China.